So if you need anything, there's nothing there. Yeah, well, we yeah, and, and I'll tell you, I mean, honestly, yeah. that's absolutely not okay. true. And, and what we're going to talk a lot about tonight is the autoimmune associations mm -hmm. of uh, these conditions. We'll talk a lot about, now I had you all fill out some paperwork. We're, uh, you filled some of it out, you didn't fill some of it out, and that's okay. We're going to reference that paperwork, and we're going to talk about where your problems are coming from. You know, and again, obviously in your case, if you're looking at your daughter, how about yourself? I really didn't know what the evening was, was about, but I just was coming with uh, Deborah just to see what it's all about. Tell them about your cancer. Uh, well, I did have, well, yeah, it's, it, I had a meningioma, a benign tumor on my, on my uh, optic nerve. It was on the optic yeah. nerve. Okay. So I had brain surgery. Sure. And um, I lost a lot of vision in this eye. Sure. And that's basically my biggest problem. Sure. <laughs> because it's a kind of it's a kind of tumor that can grow back. Sure. So, and yeah. and if we talk about that for a brief second, and, then, and we're going to get started, I'm going to give you a little background on myself. But as we talk about Crohn's, as we talk about cancers, we're talking about things that aren't fixable from a medical perspective. They come back. The reason for that is because the standard of care doesn't address the underlying causes of these dysfunctions, and that's the autoimmune nature. And and really to address and improve any of these autoimmune conditions, and cancer is an autoimmune condition, we have to address what's driving that immune response. And we're going to talk a lot about that. And, and the key thing is, you know, if you want to take prednisone or, or Embrel or, or some medication for the rest of your life, then it's going to suppress the immune system. But our goal in functional medicine is to find out why the immune system is attacking your body. And you go deeper so we can actually make a change with that. Now, to give you guys a little background on myself, my name is Dr. Gordon Grady. I, I am a chiropractic physician. I love talking about why I'm a chiropractor. And you walk through that door and you say, he's doing an IBS workshop, he's a chiropractor. Because chiropractic as a profession gets pigeonholed into a musculoskeletal model. Now, chiropractors get a really great core training when it comes to nutrition and biochemistry, but, but really our whole premise is more of a whole health. It's, it's not just back and neck pain. It's how do we get your body to work the way it's supposed to without drugs or without surgery. More specifically, my training goes a lot deeper than that. I am board certified in integrative medicine. I am board eligible as a clinical nutritionist in the American Board of Clinical Nutrition. I am enrolled in two additional fields of study I'm currently working towards. One of them is from the Care Institute of Postgraduate Neurology, working towards a degree. It's a 700 hour program. I've got a little bit of a way to go still with that. I'm about a third of the way done, uh, but I'll finish up with a chiropractic neurology degree. Uh, the last program, Something that you uh, may definitely be interested in is through an organization called A4M, Association for the Advancement in Anti-Aging Medicine, and it's an integrative cancer fellowship. And it's an organization, really, that has all these different trainings for, for it. They're AMA-sponsored. It's a huge medical group. But they have these different programs of study for doctors who want to be able to help patients. In the case of the Integrative Cancer Fellowship, it's, it's to help people. And I'm not your oncologist. I'm never going to replace them. But to support you naturally and give you alternatives. Because when we talk about autoimmune disease, when we talk about cancer and Crohn's being the two main conditions, uh, you know, I'll throw Hashimoto's out there, you know, as, as, as a condition that we see a lot of. We're talking about conditions that really, for the past 30 or 40 years, medicine has not gotten any closer to improving them at all. And, and there's another path. There has to be another way to look at it. Because, you know, the truth is there's a lot of really good research that's out there. And that research really helps support ways to address these problems. Now, I have studied under two doctors, and I like to, to mention these guys. Um, as we talk about the kinds of care that we're doing, Dr. Batiste Karazian is a functional medicine expert. He's actually one of the top thyroid experts in the world. He has a private practice in San Diego, California, and he also does a tremendous amount of research. I've had the opportunity to really mentor under him uh, for several years now, and he's one of those people who really has the ability to go through the research and, and dive in and pull it out and extrapolate what actually causes conditions, how we actually, you know, you can take 50 research studies and say, you know what, these studies talk about this one nutrient or this one pathway that's being completely missed, and then and then latch on that and be able to explore and see how that plays a role in contributing to your condition. Uh, he also wrote a really great book, it's for thyroid patients, but it really, it goes beyond that, it's about autoimmune disease as a whole, it's about metabolic problems, it's called, why do I still have thyroid symptoms when all my lab tests are normal? I've also practiced under... Dr. Mike Johnson, he is a chiropractic neurologist and autoimmune expert in Alberton, Wisconsin. He's got a particular uh, expertise in MS and really some of these harder autoimmune conditions to treat. Everything I do is to learn more so I can help you. 
And this is the key thing because I, this year it's 284 hours of continuing education. My board requires 24 for me to continue. So I go above and beyond. And again, it, it's what my passion is because my goal here is, is to quite simply, you know, in the case of your daughter and the case of the other three of you, it's to reinvent your life. Everything that I do tonight is to give you information. How can I make your life better? What can I do to give you the information that you need to make a difference with your condition or, or your loved one's condition? Um, we're here. Good evening. Come on in. No, you're okay. Come on over here. You know, like I said, number one, I'm here to reinvent your life. To do that, what I have to do is I have to give you an exit strategy. We have to give you an opportunity. In the case of Crohn's disease, how do you get off of the system where they say you can eat whatever you want and it doesn't matter? Or they say take these medications and you're stuck on them the rest of your life and we know the side effects associated with them. Or, you know, we run the risk, again, like, like we talked about with you, where, where something's going to come back. This exit strategy does mean that you're probably going to have to make some changes in your life. We'll talk about lifestyle. We'll talk about smart decisions if you want to get better. As we're talking about that, what I really want to do is talk just for a minute about the system that you're in. And we've touched on it already. I know you guys. I put this up there, and I don't even need to ask you. I mean, I know you're sick and tired of going to the doctors. And, and what you basically told me is, is you're stuck in this rut. Nothing's getting done to fix your problems. And, you know, usually, I, I, you know, 18 months, I know I, my staff asks how long you've been dealing with these conditions. As we talk about a lot of the autoimmune conditions that we treat, I see patients that have been just newly diagnosed, patients that have had the condition for 10, 15, 20 years. And when the audience looks and we see that, you know, it's, it's look to your left, look to your right. And the reality is, if you're new with this problem, you have nothing more to look forward to than dealing with this problem down the road because the doctors that you're seeing, they don't know what they're doing. Quite literally, you know, if we talk about your gut dysfunction, we talk about, you know, again, your daughter, you know, how long ago was she diagnosed with Crohn's disease? Six, seven, seven six, years ago. Yeah, six, six years ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, mm -hmm. you're talking, you know, this whole time, they're no closer towards carrying it no. than they were. No. That's why I know they don't know what they're doing. Quite literally, if they knew how to fix your problem, it would take three to six months, and there would be a solution in place, a check, a balance, here's what we're going to do to fix it, here's how we know it's fixed, end of story. And, and they're nowhere near that. Mm -hmm. Your medical doctors don't know what they're doing for one very important reason, and I already touched on the amount of research that I go through myself in my training. The overwhelming majority of physicians that are out there don't have time to read medical journals. In a modern insurance-mandated world, there's simply no time in it. They've got five to seven minutes to get from patient to patient to patient. They check in, they check out. And then if they have a few rounds on the weekends, even less time for their family. So they're not going to conferences unless it's the required CDs that they have per year. Or it's that pharmacy. They don't do that much anymore. But, you know, we always heard about in the 80s and 90s and even the 2000s where you had, you know, these big con these big seminars in South Beach that were written off because the pharmacy reps said, come on down, we'll teach you something. But uh, the reality is you're not learning. I mean, what they're learning is they're learning from what a rep comes in and says, here's the drug that we're doing now. Try this. It's a great new steroid. Try this. And they're saying, here's a research that the drug company has done to support it. Or you're learning from the AMA and you're saying, hey, here's what our medical society has said you should do as a clinical guideline. Mm -hmm. That's called an opinion. And an opinion is not a very good form of validity when it comes to scientific research. And so quite literally, the docs that we're doing for the most part are, learn, are relying on what they learned in school 15, 20, 30 years ago, and it just it's outdated information. They're never going to know what they're doing. And I want you guys to uh, write something down. Now, uh, you've all got, if, who here doesn't have a pen? I'll make sure we've got, you guys all have pens? Okay, good. I want you guys to write something down. This is important. For your daughter and for the other three of you, what you're suffering from, what you need to know, you're suffering from a web of physiological dysfunction. WOPD, if you will, but I want you to write down web of physiological dysfunction. 
What I mean by that is not any of you here. You know, again, your daughter doesn't just have Crohn's. You don't just have Crohn's. You don't just have this meningioma that you've dealt with. Uh, you know, uh, Ellen, you know, what brings you into tonight? What are you hoping to learn from tonight? I uh, suspect I have IBS, but I can't get the same to get there. I'm a gastroenterologist to help put it in for drugs in my face. Sure. Okay. Okay. So yeah. as we talk about gut dysfunction in general, or IBS as, as a whole, over name of, of just tons of different conditions associated with the gut. You know, physiologically, it's an impossibility for even you, know, you just to have that condition. And then what we're talking about here is with web physiological dysfunction, you all have a series of different things that impact your health. And if we talk about this, you know, you talk about cellular issues, you talk about the brain, your immune system, obviously we'll talk a lot about that today, your liver, hormones, thyroid, gut, we talk about adrenal issues, blood sugar issues, even emotional issues. So many different things come into play, and it creates your complaint the way you deal with it today. It's not just one little thing that's out of, out of alignment and, and with your biochemistry that's causing you to have all these symptoms. Every single one of you, and, and obviously I'm talking about your, your daughter in this case, and, and maybe you guys too for all we know, but, uh, but every single one of you has you know, gut issues. And, and, and as, we talk about, as we talk about some of these autoimmune conditions with the GI tract, as we talk about IBS, we have to talk about food sensitivities, and I'll get to that later, but a lot of those issues are genetic, so I'm just throwing that out there. You know, As we talk about some of these problems that we give our children, we have to be careful with that. You all have gut problems. You all have brain problems. You all have nerve problems. You may not think that you have one. We'll talk about that. You all have thyroid problems. And again, I feel fine. My thyroid doesn't seem to hurt. We're going to talk about what the thyroid does. You all have short-term memory problems. As we talk about this, we have metabolic problems. All these things are going on, and they're creating the kinds of symptoms that you classify as IBS or Crohn's or, or you know, again, your, your meningioma. They don't make a pill for that kind of problem. And this is the reality of what we're dealing with. It's, it's, there's nothing that you can do just to take, to have all these things go away at once. And we're going to write our own web of dysfunction down on the paper, and we're going to use some of these uh, forms that I had you fill out to kind of show what you're dealing with. Now, I told you guys that you're all dealing with a brain-based problem. You're probably thinking, really? I think my brain's pretty sharp. I want you to go to page four for me. It's the last page that I had you all fill out. Obviously, you can fill out as, as we go along, and that's fine. But what we're going to look at is we're going to talk about four parts of your brain. The first thing that I'm going to talk about with your brain is a part of your brain called the frontal lobe. This is important. The frontal lobe is where all of our personality occurs. Any changes that you've had, if you feel depression, anxiety, irritability, other changes that have been coming on, concentration issues, you know, you're just, you're, you're quick tempered, you're not the same person, or people tell you you're not the same person you were five years ago. The frontal lobe is where all these activity changes are occurring. And we're gonna talk about the hippocampus. That's a really big word but it's a really important area in the brain. The hippocampus is where you store memory. If you have a brain-based problem, if you have a memory problem, you have a problem here. The parietal lobe. Does anybody here suffer with pain or sensory changes? It could be an achiness, it could be burning or tingling um, in their body at all. Usually, I mean, you know, nervous, yeah, so. Sure, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So so the parietal lobe is really an important area for all of you because this is where all your sensory input goes into in the brain. It's on the side of our brain, and literally everything you feel is felt from this part of your brain. So it short circuits when you have a brain problem, and you get that numbness or tingling or achiness or pain. You know, some people will say, I feel like my muscles always hurt, you know, or, or I get headaches every day. It's the parietal lobe that's causing these problems. Now, more specifically, I'm going to use an example of a condition that we see a good bit called neuropathy. This is commonly where you see burning of the feet. But if you look at your feet, they're not on fire. The reason why your feet feel like they're burning is because that same parietal lobe is misfiring. It's not communicating right. And it's sending the sensation of burning out for you to feel to tell you there's something wrong. So the parietal lobe is one of those really important areas when we talk about brain function. If you talk about vision, it helps us track. If you talk about movement, again, it helps us 
kind of get from point A to point B. It, it does a lot of different things, but it's where all the sensation comes into in our body. There's one other area I want to touch on. It's called the cerebellum. And I always talk about this because it's one of those master regulators of our brain. It's actually where everything from our spine and from our hands and our organs goes up. It hits the brain in the cerebellum, and then it kind of crosses over. You've heard of left brain, right brain before. And it crosses over, and then it goes up to the brain, and you get those signals. The cerebellum is also responsible for equilibrium and balance, muscle tone, posture, allowing you to not fall over. You know, again, we talk about disc health and muscle health. All these areas go into the cerebellum. And if we have nerve problems anywhere in the body, if we have a brain problem, the cerebellum has to get those signals and process them. And if it's not doing a good job of that, the whole system slows down and, and we have issues. So that's an important area for us to look at. Now, you know, again, there are no pills to fix your parietal load. And this is important. They've actually tried. It's called Neurontin or Gabapentin, Cymbalta or Lyrica. You may have heard of these medications. They don't work. They try to dumb you down so you don't feel the pain. But eventually they wear off and the symptoms are still there. If somebody has short-term memory loss, they can't give you a pill to fix this. And, you know, the, the concept here is if you have a brain problem, you have to address what's causing the brain problem. Now, every function in your body is controlled by that brain. Everything. <clears throat> if you look at that form, that last page four, if you circled five or more yeses on this form, then you have a problem with your brain. And this is important because if we look at that, the brain controls everything. And what it does, it sends an electrical signal down your body, down your spinal cord, and it goes to your organs, it goes to your thyroid, it goes to your lungs, it goes to your heart, it goes to your stomach, it goes to your spine, it goes everywhere. And what we're going to talk about is, is pages two and three, they're called the metabolic assessment form. It's going to show us what organs are malfunctioning in your body. As we talk about that, we're going to start with, uh, if we can go to that second page. Let me get you guys all to go to the second page for me. What I'm going to do is we're all going to draw our web of physiological dysfunction out on the paper. Wherever you want to draw it, you can. If you want to follow along with me, I'm going to put my web on the whiteboard, and I'm going to circle it. And we're going to start with category one. How many of your doctors tested you for leaky gut syndrome, food sensitivities, or parasites or fungus or yeast infections when you went to them saying you had a gut problem? I mean, that seems pretty important. All those things can directly <coughs> contribute to GI problems. Category one is your colon. If you have any ones, twos, or threes that you've circled in category one, and we're on page two of this form, if you want to look and follow along where I'm going with this. Any ones, twos, or threes on that form, you have a problem with your colon. Now categories two and three. This is your stomach. Stomach acid is very important for proper nerve function. If you have bone loss, you gotta look at your stomach acid because calcium gets absorbed in the body through the stomach. If you have infections, if you have reflux issues, if you have ulcers, there's a condition called H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori, it's a bacterial infection. It occurs often in the stomach and also occur in the small intestine, but it's associated with neurological problems, it's associated with a lot of these different symptoms that we see and it's something that has to be looked for. Also, as I touch on the concept of reflux, what I see more commonly than an abundance of acid is actually patients who have too little acid. And we can see that in blood work. There's also a challenge test that we do to help identify it. It's called hypochloridria, and it's a deficiency in hydrochloric acid in your stomach. And what happens is you eat food, that stomach acid can't break down the food, so what you end up getting is a reflux of the food itself. We talk about infections don't get absorbed by the stomach. Infections can then get into your colon, the rest of your body, and create habit. Again, you talk about calcium. It doesn't get absorbed in the stomach, so it doesn't go to your bones. This is a key thing. And as we age, our stomach acid will naturally diminish, so it becomes an even bigger problem because if you say, hey, you know, I got some heartburn, what do they do? They say, take a, take a uh, purple pill. You know, take, you know, take Tums. You know, yeah, Nexium. take Tums. You know, take a Nexium. <laughs> take something that's going to help suppress your acid. Yeah. So what's it doing? It's making it worse. It's not making it better. All right. Categories two and three, again, are your stomach. Any ones, twos, or threes there, we have to look at your stomach as a part of the cause of that problem. Category four, this is your small intestine. 
90% of your food is assimilated in the small intestine. If it's malfunctioning, you can't get that food to break down, you can't get the energy your body needs to heal. And that's an important thing. That's really important for us. So category four, any ones, twos, or threes in category four, that's your small intestine. Now category five, has anybody here had their gallbladder removed? Okay. So if you look at that category, are there any ones, twos, or threes in category five? So a lot of people still have symptoms. And this is the, the, the irony of this is category five is liver and gallbladder. And I see this all the time. People say, you know what, I've got twos and threes in this category. I said, but you had your gallbladder out. Why do you still have symptoms? And, and the reality is the liver and the gallbladder are very important for metabolic function. Now, when the gallbladder is removed, the liver has to work a lot harder because the gallbladder regulates that bile that your body uses to break down fats and other nutrients. So then when it's not there, the liver basically has to always do its job. And you end up just getting a much harder work about it. You know, the liver, thyroid conversion occurs here. Once the thyroid hormone is made, it's turned on in the liver. You talk about B12, that energy-producing vitamin. It gets used and uh, it helps produce here in the liver. Hormonal clearance occurs here. So if we talk about hot flashes or menopausal symptoms, this has a huge, huge area with that. Infections and toxins, everything is eliminated through the liver. It's our huge detoxifier, our, our, our you know, garbage disposal, you know, if you will. Everything goes out here. So if we have a problem with the liver, then you're going to have a problem with your body functioning. So, you know, when you have your gallbladder removed, like I said, for a lot of people I see they have symptoms here. I call this the genius of medicine. They can take something out and you still have symptoms of it. If we talk about something that chiropractors see on a good basis is, is, is back problems. You talk about back surgeries. 50% of all back surgeries are failures. 50%. A good colleague of mine is a orthopedic spine surgeon with Ortho Carolina. He's been here quite a while. And when I first met him close to 10 years ago, we had lunch. And he was very excited about how the success was with his back surgery that, they, that he worked on. 38% was his success rate. He was excited. I wish that I could be as excited for him about that. But that's, that's not a good statistic. And that's a reality of what we're dealing with. When you know, And as we talk about that, Insurance would much gladly pay for you to have something taken out and try to figure out why it's hurting in the first place. And if we talk about insurance, you know, I'm going to make a statement that I've made over and over again, and I really feel strongly about this. I really believe that insurance keeps incompetent doctors in business. As we talk about, you know, your daughter, the, the other four of you, we talk about you're going to your doctors. You're not going there because they're good. Again, you know, six years diagnosis, you know, you know, you know 18 months down at this point, you know, your doctors won't even run the test and give you an answer. You're going there because your insurance covers him. And the reality is you have to look for the doctors that are going to get you what you need, not just what they say you should do. If they say, you know what, and, and this is very typical, it's, you know what, everything looks okay, I'll see you in six months and we'll recheck. See you in a year. Or even I'll get a note back that says patient has Crohn's, patient has Hashimoto's, patient complains of fatigue, patient complains of burning in the feet. <coughs> Everything looks good, I'll see them in a year. It's like the symptoms are there, and you're going to completely ignore it and not do any assessment at all and just say, okay, it's a checkup, you're good, I'll see you in, you know, for your next checkup, and, and gladly, obviously, take your insurance reimbursement to be done with it. And the patient gets worse in the process. There's only one thing that matters. You guys have to write this down, every single one of you. The only thing that matters is results. And you're not getting the results that you want. That's all that matters. If we look at categories one through five, careful, category five was his liver, gallbladder. All those categories we can classify as one big area, the gut, the gastrointestinal tract. And we have to talk about your immune system for a second because up to 80%, 70 to 80% of your immune system is located in your gut. So I can take a patient who comes in with infertility as their number one complaint, and they have some blood sugar problems and all these other issues contributing to it, and they say, I have no GI problems, but yet they have ovarian antibodies and their immune system's all out of whack. They have a gut problem because 80% of their immune system is in their gut. It doesn't matter if you have symptoms, that's where your body's breaking down. 
And this is important because we have to look at the connection between your gut, your brain, and the rest of your body if we're going to get you better. And even going back to the ancient Greeks, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, looked at the gut, there you'll find the cause of almost all human illness. More specifically, if we talk about your problems that we're dealing with, we talk about an immune problem, anything that causes an immune battle in your gut, anything that triggers an immune reaction is going to trigger inflammation. So if we talk about what this means, let's talk about infections. We talk about parasites, okay? How about sushi? You think it's good and healthy for you. It's raw fish. If your immune system isn't strong, you're going to get a bug that goes in there and it's going to create problems. How about Lake Norman? Beautiful lake, but it's, it's a lake. Don't drink the water, right? And, and, I mean, if we talk about that, we talk about parasites, bacterial infections, mold, yeast, fungus. I've got a patient right now who moved into their house a year ago. All their symptoms developed. Their whole life fell apart. And we're looking at biotoxins in their home. And again, you know, you talk about things that can impact your immune system. How about an undergrowth of good bacteria? We call that a dysbiosis. Our bacteria is responsible for not only helping keep your immune system healthy, uh, you ever heard of probiotics? This gives you that good bacteria again, okay? Your bacteria also makes 30% of all of your energy for your body every day. It comes out of your gut. Now, if you don't have that good bacteria, you can't make energy, and you can't eliminate infections and, and help fight off immune problems. How about food sensitivities? So this is a huge one for you guys. If you've all heard of gluten sensitivity, you probably have heard it's out there. Mm -hmm. The standard test that's done, even by the gastroenterologist, looks at something called alpha gliadin and something called tissue transglutaminin. So it looks at two markers. The problem with these markers is up until a year ago, they didn't even test the gliadin that we ate. There's something called deaminated gliadin. And again, these are big words, but think of the concept. About 50 years ago, the wheat that we were eating got changed. And, and this genetic modification, you know, California had this big bill that just got put down and got approved in Washington State to make companies label if there's genetic modification. Mm -hmm. When we talk about genetic modification of wheat, they now test for the wheat that's genetically modified in sensitivities. Up until a year ago, they didn't even test for it. So if you got tested and said negative, well, the test wasn't even looking for what you're eating. Mm -hmm. More importantly, the tests they still do, the standard tests that they do, looks at those two markers. There are 13 markers that make up wheat. So if you're negative for alpha gliadin, you could be positive for omega gliadin, gamma gliadin, glutenin, and wheat itself. And you would never know because the panel that they ran isn't sensitive enough. Tests are available that give me the ability to say absolutely 100% without, uh, you know, without any sort of hesitation you have a gluten sensitivity or you do not. That test also tells me how much of it associates with celiac disease and autoimmune reaction, how much of it associates with a sensitivity. You know, what spectrum are you dealing with? If you talk about gluten, you have to talk about other foods. You have to talk about dairy, soy, egg, how about corn or rice? How about tapioca or buckwheat or quinoa? So if you are gluten sensitive, what about the other foods that you eat? We have a panel. I use Cyrix Laboratories to do my panels. And they, do, they have wonderful immunology tests. And what they do is they look at 26 different foods. And now there are tests that are out there that will look for everything from broccoli to cauliflower to wheat. It's called an alcat. And it says, I'm sensitive to everything. It says I'm positive for everything. What am I supposed to eat? I promise you, you're not sensitive to broccoli. You know, what happens is your immune system gets inflamed. So everything responds when you run these kinds of tests. That's called leaky gut. It's something that we also have to look for, and there are markers that allow me to actually test for that. When we talk about your gastrointestinal problems, we have to ask, do you have a food sensitivity? Do you have leaky gut syndrome? Do you have infections in the stomach or colon? Do you have a stomach acid problem? Is it really low stomach acid and not high? How about, do you have an autoimmune condition? Again, if we talk about ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, or celiac, we have to talk about why the immune system is attacking it. If we talk just for one more second about how this immune reaction occurs, inflammation develops, whether it comes from a food or an infection or one of these other things that we're talking about in that web of dysfunction. That inflammation goes to the gut. 
when it gets to the gut, there's a huge connection that sends those signals, those inflammatory signals, to the brain. And what happens is that food that you're eating could directly be responsible for your depression or your anxiety or your neuro neurological problems and the burning that you feel in your hands. And I see a lot of links talk about the H. pylori infection associated with a lot of patients who have neuropathy and that burning they feel in their hands and feet because of the infection in their stomach. Now, 90% of your brain cells are actually immune cells. They're called microglial cells. So what we're talking about is if you activate these brain cells, it's going to cause inflammation. And again, we talk about inflammation, it really makes your brain work a lot less than we want it to. Okay, so if we're moving right along, we're going to go back to the metabolic assessment form. Category six and seven, guys, is blood sugar. Blood sugar should be 85 to 99. If it gets too low, it's going to kill nerves. Hypoglycemia is very common in patients. Those nerves get damaged. They affect the brain. They affect your stomach. They affect your extremities, your hands, your feet. If I'm going to get you better, the maximum results, if we're going to change your life, we have to fix <coughs> blood sugar. That's a huge, huge thing. And what we're seeing is there's not just one thing that's wrong with you. If you have any ones, twos, or threes in categories six and seven, you're dealing with a blood sugar problem. Blood sugar is responsible for a huge primary fuel source for the body. I mean, it's what the brain needs to function. Sugar and oxygen is our lifeline. If we don't have enough of it, if it's not proper, we're going to have poor brain function. Category eight, actually eight and nine, is the <coughs> adrenal glands. Your adrenal gland sits on top of your kidneys. It's your stress gland. It regulates stress in your body. And if you get stressed, cortisol is going to get abnormal and it's going to go up. And you know what happens is cortisol actually directly <coughs> will impact the hippocampus. It's going to attack those memory centers in your body. There's a direct correlation between set categories eight and nine in the metabolic assessment form. Then you ones, twos, or threes that are there, we have to look at cortisol levels. The adrenals also release two hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine. They actually can stimulate pain fibers. So a lot of patients who have pain can be a stress problem that actually makes it worse. I've had patients that come in with IBS, and their symptom is anxiety. If they get anxiety, if they think about something, then, then they, have, they have an IBS episode. And it's that big of a link between the two. Now, we're all at risk of adrenal fatigue. There's five stages of it, and we have to make sure that we know where your adrenals are functioning. <coughs> And you can't do this in a blood test. It's got to be done in a saliva test. We've got to get four measurements throughout the day so I know what cortisol, what your adrenal gland is doing. It's more accurate and it's an easier way to look at your function. Now, categories 10 and 11 is thyroid. If you have low thyroid function, called hypothyroidism, you're going to have brain problems, so you're going to have gut problems. 90% of all hypothyroid patients have hypothyroidism as a result of autoimmune problems. This was published 15 years ago in the Journal of Metabolic and Endocrine Disorders, which is the main thyroid journal in the world. And it's held up. Again, we talk about your thyroid gets damaged for a reason, and that reason is the immune system is attacking it. Now, for you all, this is very important because every cell in your body has thyroid receptors. Everything gets function for that area. It supports everything from bone metabolism to gut function to fat burning to proper stomach acid. Literally, the thyroid, if you're diabetic, you have a thyroid problem. Blood sugar is a huge link to it. There's nothing that doesn't link back to your thyroid. I mean, it's, it's kind of thing. If a patient comes in who has an autoimmune problem, I'm looking at their thyroid as part of that dysfunction. And for, for Crohn's, for cancer patients, we have to look at the thyroid and how it's reacted to it. Now, one interesting thing to talk about. We've talked about adrenals. We've talked about thyroid. With thyroid function, everything starts in the pituitary gland. It makes something called TSH. You may have heard of that test. It's a common thyroid test that's done. Everything actually starts above that in the hypothalamus. It's in the brain. So the brain tells the body, the pituitary gland, what to do. And this whole connection, we call it the HP axis, the hypothalamus pituitary axis, regulates your thyroid, your adrenals, so your stress, and your male and female hormones. So all your endocrine systems are regulated by one key area. And if you have a problem with one, it's going to cause a problem in the rest. We can fix ten things, but if I don't fix this one area, then you're still going to have symptoms. You know, everything has to be addressed because of the relationship between them. Now, how many of you have gone to the doctor and you, they say your labs look good? There's nothing wrong with you. Sure. 
So, you know, and, and of course you don't feel that way. I mean, there's problems that are developing. And, and the answer for why this is happening, they're not running the right tests. They don't run nearly enough. They run the bare minimum tests that insurance covers. And if you run the bare minimum tests, what do you get? The bare minimum results. And they're using traditional lab ranges. Traditional lab ranges don't give us enough information. Now, I use Quest, I use Solstice, I use LabCorp, the same labs all these other docs use. And they give me a functional range. It comes, or they give me a reference range, excuse me, that comes back. That reference range is a bell curve. It's statistics. Now, who gets blood work done every month? What kind of a person? A healthy person? No. Yeah. So, so, but you have a health problem. So you have to go every month. If you're healthy, you may go every year or every five years, depending on how, how smart you are, right? <laughs> so these statistics, these ranges, are based on unhealthy people. They're functional. So they're so big. The problem is, you know, if, if we say, hey, you know what? You're inside the range. All we know is, you know, congratulations. You're as healthy as everybody who's sick. We just we don't know anything. And if you're out of that range, then yeah, there's definitely a problem. But we have to look at a narrower range. It's called a functional lab range. And in functional medicine, it's what we look at. They're more sensitive, and they allow us to reveal more problems. And what we're talking about is you've got that lab high or lab low, and if you're there, your docs say something's wrong. And half the time, they'll say, I'll see you in six months and see if it clears up on its own. Sometimes they'll do something about it. <laughs> If you're here, you're healthy in the functional lab range. But if you're here, there's a problem. It's just not bad enough for them to name a disease after you. And we don't want it to get so bad that we have to. Now, those functional lab ranges are published in the medical literature. It's what we use in our practice. I'll give you guys two quick examples of that. TSH I want to use, okay? So again, this is your thyroid. A normal healthy range is 1.8 to 3.0. The lab ranges are typically 0.4 to 4.5. They're pretty big ranges. There's one endocrine society, 8,000 endocrinologists, that says that the range should go from 0.4 to 3.14. So again, almost the consistency with the functional high level, but you can see how much higher the labs go. So if you're 4.2, your doctor, even your endocrinologist, who doesn't read his research, is going to say, you know what? You're borderline. You're okay. There's nothing I'm going to do about it and they pass you off and they wait to see down the road if you get sicker. The problem is, we know there's a problem today that can be addressed, and we have to. Now, cholesterol is another one I want to touch on. I've had three patients this week who have cholesterol under 150. Not over, not high, but low. And, and the two of them, the docs said, your cholesterol is the best I've ever seen. One was 113, one was 120. Both these patients were male, and they both had tremendous issues with libido and what we call andropause. The reality is your cholesterol is a precursor for sex hormones. And if you don't have enough cholesterol, you're not making hormones. You have to have your numbers in balance. And too low can be just as bad as too much. When we talk about elevated cholesterol, cholesterol is not the problem. We talk about an immune problem, we talk about anything, we're talking about this inflammation, right? Inflammation is what damages the endothelium of our red blood cells. Inflammation is not from cholesterol, it's from everything else we're talking about. And cholesterol is just the tool our body uses to try to heal that damage. Whether cholesterol is 120 or 300, your body's still going to use it to try to heal, and you're still going to develop that plaque in it. So going on a statin drug isn't going to affect what's causing it. It's just going to try to su suppress something they know they can suppress. You know, it's, you know, I can't fix that, but it's really causing it, so I'm going to work over here on something that may help you a little bit. You know, that's, that's a general approach. And the point is, I don't want you guys to be normal. If you want normal, go to Walmart. <laughs> Sit down and look at the healthy people that are there, or the lack of it. The new American normal is a sick population. I want you guys to be healthy. <laughs> that optimal healthy level that we're looking for is what we try to strive for, and it's what we're going to look for with you when we look at a functional perspective. Now, the last couple categories we have to talk about are your hormones. On that form, any ones, twos, or threes in category 14 and 15, these are your male hormones. We're talking andropause, prostate problems. Categories 16 and 17 are female hormones. We start with uh, menstruating or cycling females. We're talking infertility issues, menstrual cycle imbalances, and then we get into menopause. You know, and how many patients I see who've been postmenopausal for seven years, 20 years, 30 years, and still have hot flashes? 
this is a common thing, there's a problem with your hormones. Why? Because of blood sugar, because of adrenal issues, because of thyroid issues, because of your brain. All these things impact your hormones. And again, the key thing is finding the cause of the problems, not just looking at one specific area. Now, your web of physiological dysfunction, sometimes these forms tell us exactly what we have to look at. Sometimes they, we have to go a little deeper and we look at testing with that. The key thing is to look at where your health problems are coming from so we can identify how we're going to get you better. Now, there is an order to all this chaos. It's a lot. I mean, talk about that form. There's so much going on. How do we deal with it, right? I have to look at certain things. And if I address these certain things, I'm going to get you better. And if we don't fix these problems, then you're going to continue to suffer. And they're really important. First and foremost, do you have an autoimmune condition? With Crohn's disease, the answer is yes. With cancer, the answer is yes. With a lot of these other conditions, the answer is yes. If you have that autoimmune condition, the question becomes, what's pushing it? What's dri driving it? What's making it attack your body? That's all these other issues combined. And then there's some other things we look at specifically as well. Once I figure that out, you know, and again, there could be all these other problems we're talking about, then you got to fix it. So you gotta, if you're autoimmune, then we know that trumps everything else. It really does. You have a blood sugar problem. It's the number one stressor in your body. It can impact the thyroid, the heart, the gut, your hormones. You know, it's the number one cause of infertility, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. And it's an insulin resistance problem. It's a blood sugar problem. How about anemia? I'm not talking about iron. I'm talking about your red blood cells. Iron can be involved, but there's, I think there's close to, what, 20 different types of anemias. And I uh, had a great lecture about six weeks ago where I uh, spent eight hours literally teaching, going over every single one of those. And, and, and it's, it's fascinating to see how many different types of red blood cell dysfunctions can impact people. And I'm not going to bore you with that, I promise you. But the reality is we got to look and see what you're dealing with. If you have an inflammatory problem, I'm taking a blowtorch and I'm taking it right to your cells and it's causing inflammation. That's homocysteine, C-reactive protein, fibrinogen. These kind of tests look for inflammation in your brain, inflammation in your nerves, inflammation in your gut, inflammation in your heart. How about, obviously, we know many of you have a gut problem. As we talk about that, we have to see what type of problem. Is it infections? Is it stomach acid? Is it food sensitivities? Is it leaky gut? So no matter what you put in your body, you react against it. By identifying that, we can help manage what's driving the immune attack in your gut, and then we address the immune system as a whole to calm it down. Um, and, and just to throw it out there, if any of you have been on prednisone before, or know people who have, we actually use a supplement in the office. It comes from uh, turmeric, it's called curcumin. It's actually more powerful than prednisone, and it has none of the side effects, and it actually helps regulate your immune system. It's one of those things. So you talk about things that are natural, that can have more of an impact on your health than a horrible prescription drug that, that they usually reach into as a first-line defense. You know, over and over again, again, you talk about somebody, uh, you know, a friend of mine who had UC when I was, when I was growing up, you talk about all the stretch marks on him and, and the debilitation that he would have for months at a time when they put him on prednisone. Mm -hmm. Thyroid, it's a key area we got to look for. Your lipids, it's a key area. Your fatty acid metabolism, all these things are really important for how your body's functioning. we got to fix them if I'm going to get you better. If I'm going to help gastrointestinal problems, if I'm going to help your Crohn's, if I'm going to help your IBS, we figure out what's driving your GI problems. We talk about all those different causes. We remove it or we support and fix it. Once we do that, your immune system may still be driving and attacking your body, it's just not being pushed farther. So we have to modulate or calm it down. By modulating the immune system, we use simple tools, vitamin D, curcumin, fish oils, glutathione, and if any of you take supplements, they may not be helping you, they may be hurting you. I have patients who come in with bags, 20 supplements, there are <laughs> 10 of them are pushing one half of their immune system, the other 10 are pushing the other half. So they're canceling each other out and making them worse. you got to use support where your body needs it. In my office, I use therapies, brain-based therapy, to help drive neurological function. We talked about that early on and how important the brain is to help improve metabolic health. I can fix your insides, if you will, your metabolic health, but if your brain is still abnormal, it's going to cause damage right back again. You have to address both sides of the equation. A lot of things that we do, you can do at home as well. In my office, everything that we do kind of leads up to helping you guys get a better life. And I told you when we started, my number one job today was to reinvent your life. Life is a matter of choices. 
hopefully, I've been able to give you enough information to help reinvent your life a little bit tonight. But we know all the knowledge that I've given you over the past 45 minutes is worth nothing if you don't take actions. Knowledge and actions is how you get results, and that's what we're all looking for with you. So I want you guys to think about what happens if you decide to schedule an appointment with me. If you decide to take the next step and see how I can help you one-on-one. -on -one. What can improve in your health? More importantly, if you decide not to do anything, to continue on the path that you're on, where do you see yourself in three years, in five years, if you don't fix what we talked about tonight? If you continue to suffer not knowing if you have an issue with some of these foods, or those bugs, or that hormonal involvement that's impacting your gut. You know, we talk about all these different things. If we don't address those problems, what's going to happen? And the answer to that is probably nothing good. You'll continue on the path. I want you to really think about that because we want to change it. We want to get your life better, give you that exit strategy. If you like what you heard, you know I can sit up here all night. I talk and I teach a lot, and that's, that's, that's what I like to get. That's my gift back to everybody is to educate. But the reality is if you guys want to get better, you have to schedule an appointment. That simple. What I always do in my office whenever I, whenever I do workshops, my normal new patient consultation is a two visit process. It's roughly two to two and a half hours of my time. Plus, before you come in, if you've got a huge stack of, of labs and paperwork, I'm going to review it. We're going to go through everything. I'm going to feel like I know your medical history better than almost any other doctor you've ever seen. And so when we talk, we're going to make good use of your time to figure out solutions for you. My normal new patient process is $450. Because you guys came to these workshops, I reduced that down to $60. That's for the same two visit special. It allows me to go through and see if I can help you. When you come in, I'm going to do a full neurological examination. I'm going to do a full case review. And we're going to look to see how your body is functioning. I want you guys to bring loose fitting clothes, t-shirts or shorts. I'm going to look at your hands and feet or look at your, you know, so we're doing, it, we're doing a neurological exam. I need to be able to get to those parts. Um, so definitely bring, bring something accordingly with it as it gets colder. <coughs> I don't require spouses at the exam, but I definitely recommend. We're going to do a lot of tests on you. We're going to go through a very detailed evaluation. And it's good to have somebody here with you. I want them here for the report of findings. They need to know how much stuff you are. They need to know what I found, and they need to know what we're going to do to help fix it. With that being said, I thank you all for your time tonight. Andrea will be more than happy to help schedule your appointments. Thank you. Thank you.